veterans. So these were at risk youth coming out of juvie who were helping reintegrate them into the community. A ton of purpose. Um, really enjoyed it, and then I, I just got burnt out. It was it's hard work. It's hard seeing what continues to happen to these kids, and and just not making a lot of money too. So um, all of that started to contribute to, to burnout and trying to figure out what's next. And then I, I discovered real estate investing. And, uh, you know, I always thought that buying a house meant giving up freedom. I really love to mountain bike. That's me and Moab, the boys on Captain Jack's, and then, you know, skiing at, I think, Copper. So, you I know, mean, I was living with a group of dudes and the, the guy owned the home and I was, you know, I knew I was helping pay his mortgage, but I thought that it was worth it for the, the freedom that I had to go do these fun things. And uh, coming back, maybe from this ski trip actually, or another one, my buddy was listening to Bigger Pockets in the car, and I thought, oh, this is an interesting idea, like financial independence, real estate investing. And so I really just stumbled upon it um, in, in that on that car ride. And, and started looking into it and, and getting educated and I thought oh, this could be a way for me to sort of transition out of social work and, and get into something else. So I read some of these books here. This was a lot about financial independence, thinking about money, obviously Rich Dad Poor Dad, some Bigger Pockets podcasts. The two biggest things I think I learned, the two like best quotes that I took away from some of that education was you know, if I try this and I fail, what's the worst that's going to happen? Uh, I'm, I'm right back on the path that I probably was. And maybe my credit's screwed and I can't do much for seven years with a credit card or another house. But, like, I'm right back to where I was. So, I thought, oh, that's pretty sweet. Uh, and then I like this quote about, like, living like no one can for a couple of years and you can live like no one can for the, for the rest of your life. So, uh really like those financial independence quotes. So if you're looking for a mentor, somebody that can help you sort of do this, I have some really good advice for you, and that is to call numbers on light poles. <laughs> so I was riding my bike to Palmer Park to mountain bike, and I was coming from my buddy's house where I was paying rent and helping him pay his mortgage, and I thought, I was already sort of on this train of like, I want to do house hacking and I want to pursue this financial independence. And this, and I need an exit plan, right? If I'm going to scale to the next one, then this first one that's going to become a rental when I buy the second one needs to still cash flow. And I thought, I'm close to the college, I like this area, let's do student rentals. This guy had like five properties on a rained out flyer on a light pole across from UCCS, and I was like, that's what I want to do. So I called him, I asked if I could take him to lunch can't read this number so I just guessed and got lucky just kidding I went up to the next street and this one hadn't been rained out <laughs> and I called him I said hey can I take you to lunch and he said no I'm too busy but I'll show you my properties and I didn't know he was a realtor uh, but he was Mark Perlman with Lion Realty he was just kind of blown up in the student rental game and uh, he was my my real estate agent and, and sort of my mentor to help me through this process. So he helped me find this first house hack, which is by ECCS. It was listed as three bedrooms. There was actually four. The garage is sort of weird. They like had a garage back here and then it was separate from the house and then they built this, built a garage and a covered walkway into the house. So it's kind of the drive through one garage and then like you could push a button and the other garage could open and you could like drive into like, the, it's like a tandem garage, which was really weird. And I looked at that and he was like, there's a fifth bedroom, you can rent this out. And I said, that's my studio Airbnb. And it's funny because the reason I was thinking about that as an Airbnb, I didn't realize until like a couple months ago was I had been to a meetup and Michael on the Red Joy team uh, was giving a talk about him Airbnb his cottage downtown how to pay for his mortgage and I, I finally made that connection that that's who it was like as I was talking with those guys like a couple months ago so like, that's why I looked at that garage I was like that's an Airbnb um, so my realtor like helped me draw plans he took me to regional building department uh, 
helps me get to play with the crew, introduce me to contractors, we got bids, and like the bug was caught with the cash flow. But that's the, so this is the first garage, drive through the second, being used as storage, and we ripped it out and turned it into a studio apartment. 200 square feet, kitchenette with a, with a full bathroom. And then these are the numbers. So purchase price 260, that was clearly a couple years ago. <laughs> uh, made 1800. I rented out three bedrooms for 600 each. My monthly rent, my uh, average for the Airbnb was 1650, so I'm bringing in 3450 on a house hack, which is pretty sweet and definitely something that I didn't really think was possible. Those are my expenses. Personal loan, 264. I brought 20K from my dad at 10% interest for 10 years. My own father, 10% interest. He said, you're a risk. You have that I don't know what's going on. Um, obviously extremely grateful that I have a dad who's willing and able to give me 20 grand, but 10% um, is pretty rough, but you know, if I can do it with that, it definitely taught me some good stuff. So. Cash flowing, netting, 1900 a month. Obviously that's pretty exciting and something that I want to continue doing, so. Ryan, was that how much you were making like entirely previously? Was that like your total income as a social worker almost? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah, that's about, let's say it's 24,000. Let's round it up to two, that's like, yeah, six to 12 away from my social yeah. salary. So you must replace your salary with one product. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, and that, yeah. <laughs> so second house hack, same thing. Um, it was listed as three, it was three. There was a family room. I moved some walls around in the closet in the hallway and made a fourth bedroom and then I converted this two car garage into a studio apartment. I borrowed 10K from three different people for a total of 30K. I cut my dad out. <laughs> Negotiated better interest rates with, with friends and my grandparents and uh, converted the two car garage. Learned that bedroom rental management is easy. It's not super scalable in my opinion unless you get people on longer leases. Still kind of annoying. But this is the second garage. We framed in this door so it's completely separate from the house. We made a pretty sick second unit, 400 square feet studio apartment. 318, 59, total rent, 2,800. At the time, this number will go up. Cash flow in, 938. So you're renting out the garage separately as a long-term rental? Yes, and I put it on Airbnb in the summer, and I this was the first year was the rent, and then I'll get to it in a minute, but I I had to take, make me take it off Airbnb price of 1500 and somebody did that for the school year, because it's four houses from the nursing school, so. Uh, so total passive income, 2800 now clearly above my social work income. <laughs> this is house act number three. This is where I currently live. My girlfriend and I live up here. We Airbnb in the basement. This is our dog, Lily. <laughs> this was a pain in the ass. Like, um, the lender and the appraiser really messed up. Really, the lender did. The appraiser marked it as highest and best use, but the lender and their system had it as one unit. And it was illegal, legal, not illegal, legal, non-conforming duplex. And the lender had it as one unit. And so it was sending bells off in their system, but no one really looked into it. And they said, you've got to get a letter from the city saying this is a legal use, and if it burns down, you can rebuild it as a duplex. But it's zoned as single family. So if it burns down, I can't. But I have to get them to agree to that. So I have to prove that it's been built as a duplex, annexed into the city as a duplex, and continuing to operate as a duplex. So believe it or not, the library <laughs> helped me out and they have records, phone book records from however long ago, but at least since the 50s, 
And my house has been listed as 518 and 518 and a half. Nice. And How long ago? Deal that with, huh? When was that? Man, 50s? When was this? <laughs> No, 518 is my address. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> but that's when it was built, was the 50s, so we definitely went back that far. Oh, okay. So, library's pretty sweet. <laughs> Don't take no for an answer. I learned a lot about, like, dealing with the city zoning department. And after all that, I looked at the appraisal and I said, the appraiser marked this as highest and best use. What's the problem, lender? And they're like, oh, we had it as one unit in our system. You're actually fine. You didn't need to do any of that. <laughs> but now that it's two units and you're already trying to do conventional, you have to come up with 15% instead of five. Nice. And I really didn't want to do an FHA because I barely qualified for this and I was about to quit my software sales job and I transitioned to software sales. And I like didn't think I was gonna qualify. Like I was so surprised that I qualified for this. I'm like, I have the money. Luckily, I'm just going to put down 15%, which is a little painful for a house hack, but um, yeah, people in systems make mis check mistakes, check them. Lily approves. <laughs> He's up there on her porch, perch, barking at everybody. So, uh, this is the current house hack. It, I live for free. The Airbnb downstairs doesn't do as well as if it was managed by Renjoy, but <laughs> it does all right. And um, make another 859, so that's my total. And then updated numbers, so that's my total sort of passive yearly income if I annualized Brookside, which I bought last year. So also did a burr. Oh, I recognize this place. You do? That was a rough property, dude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Ryan, what's Burr? Oh, Burr is uh, buy, rehab it, refinance, or rent it out, then refinance, get all your money back, and then go repeat it with another property. So it's a great way to get a bunch of properties and you keep getting your money back. But it's a lot of work and it takes hunting for a good deal. So I've been looking at this property for a while and I am 100% with stamped mailers as far as grade off my properties. So the hard, <laughs> man, the hard money lender told me to hang it up and that'll never happen again. I don't know if I will. I don't know if I want to break my streak, but I found a guy who owned it. It was owned in an LLC. I looked up that LLC on the, um, the, the secretary's website, of state whatever, business website. It was owned by another LLC. I Googled that LLC. It's an LLC that specializes in covering up people's identities with LLCs. <laughs> and I was like, shit, I don't have an address for this guy. I'm just gonna pick one of the LLCs. And I sent a mail and I said, I don't know who you are. I respect that you hit your name so well. Like, I'd like to buy your property, like, call me. And he called me a couple days later and was like, um, let's see, started at 410, it dropped at 360 before it expired. Yeah, Schlinker, right? yeah, that was yeah. yeah and then once it expired, um, he called me and said we're at 330 now. And then we got him down to 270. Wow. <laughs> Negotiating. Um, but we found all this stuff wrong with it. Um, we had to do a full replumb because it had frozen in the house. We had to insulate the walls. There was no insulation in any of the walls. The sewer line is falling apart. It's still falling apart. That's sort of a big unknown. Um, and the, like you walk in and you feel like you're being like thrown to the back wall. Like that's how much like slopes were going on in this house. And so we got um, two different foundation companies to come in. Obviously they're incentivized to tell you everything's wrong and you need to fix a bunch of stuff. So we used all those estimates and really uh, talked him down to 270. We had a plan of putting about 20 into the foundation to stabilize it and then like ripping up some floors and jacking up the floor beam to straighten some floors. But we called an engineer out, paid 500 bucks, and he said, what's your goal? And we said, that's for property. And he said, this property is fine, you don't need to do anything. 
So it was the best $500 I've ever spent. <laughs> oh, I should say I teamed up with my dad on this one. So we're 50-50 partners. Let him back in. Um, let him back in. <laughs> So, got a hard money loan for 330. We bought it for 270, 60k to rehab. Uh, we are fully furnished, all fixed up for 81,000. Decorated landscape, hot tub, fire pit. We're projecting to make that much money, 21,000 ish. And uh, yeah, it's all done. I mean, pretty happy with with how it's going. I think me and my dad each have like 30k left in it. So. It appraised for 490. We're pretty happy with that return. Then I refinanced this property recently. Purchased for 260. It appraised for 410. Obviously, the last couple years have been crazy. Wouldn't count on that again. But I pulled out 55,000 two weeks ago. This is an old slide. That was about six months ago now. But and my payments stayed the same. So I lowered my interest rate and got rid of PMI. So, hold out 55K for free. Just saying, that sounds pretty. This is just sick. Um, so, if you just take out the cash out refi, I put 10K down on that property and I made 55K, 50K on the refi, 500% return. And that's nice. Uh, so, I said bye bye to the W2. Yeah. Um, so professional. Yeah, look at that headshot. Dude. I know, the headshot said goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to find this as LinkedIn photo too? Yeah, soon. Actually, my girlfriend is a photographer, videographer, and she was like, you want to get some new headshots? So we literally did that like two days ago. <laughs> <laughs> she knew all the extensive editing as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She, got rid of, she got rid of some blemishes, <laughs> cleaned up the stash. She added a little hair here. <laughs> Um, so continuing to like invest and, and continue to help clients do the same. So um, final tips, declare your income. Um, number one, it's illegal not to. Number two, it helps you scale to the next house by erasing your, your mortgage debt to income. Um, be creative. If, if multifamily doesn't work, then get a house with a walkout basement or a garage you can convert. Don't be afraid to ask people in your life to invest, right? People are scared of the stock market right now, especially like negotiate an interest rate with them and, and see if, if they're willing to give you some money and, and partner with you. Um, have reserves, budget for more each month, and then keep getting educated. Educate yourself. <laughs> That's all I got. Got any questions? Happy to answer them now or afterwards. So, thank you. I did for a little while, but now I've now I've switched to Renjoy. Do you know Mr. Money Mustache? Then? No, I never met him. Okay. And they they work together in Long Island. Mr. Money Mustache is the financial independence guy. Yeah. Long yeah, we had a retreat at his office, but I uh, never I never space. met him. Yeah. I was going to join him, but I just did shops. <laughs> Next slide, of course, you need Yeah, sign up. <laughs> what questions you guys got? Any questions? Yeah, I got it. How much, what's your percentage a month uh, away for a Um, I do, uh, I gotta look at my spreadsheet, but it's about like 8% for CapEx, 5% for maintenance, and 7% for vacancy. Those numbers might be flipped around, but that's generally. And how long are your turnover periods? I mean, I was doing, I, I was doing bedroom rentals, so I really only have had maybe three months of one bedroom vacant at different times throughout the last three years. Okay. So, so three months total across all three properties. Yeah. Okay. Did you save money for fixing the foundation? Uh, no, we just improved the, the drainage and get water away from the house, fix the gutters, extend the downspouts. And the engineer just recommended this is fine. It's been here for so long. That's the thing I think with foundation is like it's so scary, but sometimes it's like 
it's been here so long, shifting in Colorado is normal, and they suggest, you know, improving the drainage. So that was kind of the recommendation for that one. How did you find the engineer? Um, I think I asked another realtor friend. Oh, yeah. So how did you, we're pretty new in the rental space, but how did you take out the no, it wasn't refinance. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was so a cash out. Refinance. So I I got the mortgage for you know 260 at four and a half percent a couple years ago, and then it appraised for what 410. So I can take a loan for about 80 percent of that, and 80 percent of 410 was like what 315, 310 something. So I got a loan for 310 at like 3% or 3.5%. So that's my new mortgage. And my old mortgage was now like 250. So I was given 310 as a mortgage. I got the difference from what I owe to what they, they just gave me. Okay, so it only go, your interest rate only go up if you took out more than 80%? Well, the interest rate went down because at the time I bought it was four and a half, and at the time I was refinancing, interest rates had gone down. So I got lucky that interest rates went down. It's not tied to your loan amount. The rate is not tied to your loan amount. Not much. Okay. Yeah. It's a little like, honestly, that process confused me for a while on percentages and all the numbers. So if you want to get a little more in depth with it, we can. Okay. Yeah, we're trying to do this. Well, I went realtor in March of 2021 20, part time. So that's 1099. And then I quit my W 2 when I bought the third house hack in like July of last year. So I have to have two years of income as a 1099 before I can get the next one. But the plan is another house hack in March ish. Maybe earlier if I can convince the landlord. So with your next house hack, are you planning to also just add an Airbnb garage or whatever you find appropriate with any property? Um, I really want a garage now. <laughs> yeah. it's not, like, I was very much on like the lifestyle. Creep. There's a great continuum. Yeah, there's a great continuum of like of looking at like profitability versus comfortability, and it was like no right answer, right? It's whatever's right for you. At the beginning, I was like profitability. Like, I don't need a garage and we'll live in that. We'll rent out every bedroom. But now, you know, I've got serious girlfriends. I've got a mountain bike that I really like. I'd like to go to my It needs its own room. The dog needs its own room. So it's like, I don't think I'm going to convert a garage. Um, but I'll probably get like a maybe like a walkout basement or something like that or 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 an R2 property with an attached garage and a detached garage and I can convert the detached garage or house and cottage. I mean I definitely want a separate unit. That's kind of where I'm at now. And do you think your cash flow would be less like let's say you bought like a house with no garage and three bed too bad and Airbnb like an individual room. Do you think your cash flow would be Lucas, Airbnb, you know, any you know, Airbnb bedrooms? I've never done that. I've never done it personally. I don't know. It seems like a lot to manage, so I've never tried that. And I don't know if it's much more profitable than just having a long term tenant. In the summertime, like 60 to 80 bucks per night per room is pretty average. Okay. I don't know about the winter time. It's totally dangerous. Uh, it does drop down pretty considerably. Falls pretty decent. Uh, I think I've still seen like 50 or 60 in the fall. What about like travel? Travelers in the winter time. Is there a spike or is it kind of really no correlation with the season? I don't know that there's necessarily a correlation with the season in terms of them coming in, but there's a higher supply, so I think you could expect still lower revenue in the summer, in the winter time. I mean, also, also think about it, we got, what, two hospitals coming on the line here in the next uh, 10 months to a year? So, I mean, there's definitely going to be some more demand. I would say the risk is worth it, as in there's very little risk in just trying it. Um, yeah. 
right? Your furnishing costs are relatively below for a bedroom, so you might as well, like if, if that's what you think would work. I know some people that are having great success with it. People are booking out bedrooms for three months at a time, 60 yeah. bucks a day, so. Does anybody know why hospitals hire temporary nurses? Side is this like this risk is so low that I'm going to take that for like this upside? Cool, yeah. I think that's just, I think, um, you know, like hearing Ryan's story, our immediate uh, response sometimes is just to think, like, oh, yeah, he felt confident like doing that or like converting that garage or purchasing that property was like easy. But the truth is, like, for a lot of us that have purchased multiple properties everyone is scary, especially when you're taking on large renovations like converting a garage or taking on a new challenge like starting an Airbnb. There's inherent risk in every investment that you make, but we overestimate how difficult or like we overestimate the risk that we're taking on. So we, I think we have a tendency to say, um, you know, like, oh, what happens if the worst case scenario were to happen? And we think the whole world is gonna come crashing down. But I think Ryan hits at a good point where if worst case scenario were to happen, there's a bunch of different pivot strategies that we could utilize to still at least save the asset or save the things that we're trying to build. 
And so I just encourage everyone, understand the risk that you're taking and understand um, that sometimes we're over overestimating the risk that we're taking and sometimes it's just as simple as taking action, surrounding yourself with the right people and running, uh, just running your numbers correctly. Right, you find yourself like doing kind of like a little bit of a twinge of nervousness when you're like taking on a new bike route. Like are you like constantly pushing your capabilities on the mountain bike in a similar way? similar way to the house hack. Yeah, like every, like not like every single ride, but like, yeah. you know, you're constantly trying to do more and more difficult routes. Yeah, I am. And you're a little bit scared, but you do it. Yeah, for sure. But it's so fun. Yeah, I haven't thought about that connection. I like it. What were your emotions when you did your first garage conversion? I can't believe my dad's charging the 10%. <laughs> <laughs> that makes the HELOC I'm applying for right now seem a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the numbers still work with 10% interest. Yeah. 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 My dad's calling me. Should I pick up? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's like, it's dude. That's all. <laughs> 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 <laughs>